Episode 43 opens with the revelation that Yusaku is alive because plot armor bullshit. Who cares? I don't care. You probably don't care. And I don't even think the show cares. <laughs> like, seriously. They treat revealing that Yusaku is okay like it's a chore. Just so we can get to the balls to the wall cum sock full of spunk levels of awesome that was the full revolver reveal. This was genius and the best thing this show has done in a long time. First up, let's talk about Revolver's design. Let's just get that out of the way. I've had thoughts about this since the minute we learned what his hair looked like because let's be real here. When it comes to anime like this, these characters live and die by their designs. Uh, I think it's a great design. I love how there's a very normal person sense to him. This looks like someone who in this universe you would walk past on the street and never notice like our main characters did. In previous Yu-Gi-Oh's we see an emphasis on the rivals having these very striking, very dominating, very intimidating presences which is great and works for those stories. But to make this work and to make this character work you had to create a contrast between Revolver in the Link Brains and Ryokyun, I think is how you pronounce that name in the real in their version of the real world. Because of this, we get a very genius design, especially when it comes to color. If you notice, when he's in Link Vrains, his primary color is still white, but with the black and red accents. These are meant to be colors of aggression, colors of war, colors that show his desire to fight and to hurt. Then when you see him in the real world, he is this white and ice blue look to him. He's this cold, calculating intelligence. That idea that when you meet the man behind the curtain, he is just a man, he just happens to be really clever. Now, as for the backstory, one might say just doing it all as an exposition dump could be lazy, and a lot of times it is. But, what I liked about this is we established a, or at least enough of, an emotional reason to why he just gave everyone everything he needed to know. His dad just died. And remember, his introduction scene is that. The full reveal of what he looks like, minus his eyes, we'll get to that, is important there because he's not in his right mind. He's never in his right mind. He's insane. But in this instance, he's grieving. He's sad. He's trying to think about his father. He's probably going through in his head everything that happened. So when Yusaku and Kusunagi show up and he starts explaining, it almost feels like this is his like testimony. This is his sort of getting everything off his chest. Someone probably could have just walked in to deliver a pizza and he probably just would have started talking about all this insanity. And as for the revelations, I think this is actually where we should have had the revelation that Ignis is cloned from Yusaku. Because that was handled great. First up, I love the fact that the professor is gone. Or he's gone for now. Could they maybe do a thing where like he copied his consciousness onto a program and he comes back to be the final baddie? Maybe, but if he doesn't, I don't care. He's not that important, and the show did a very good job of keeping the focus away from him. The show is focused on the characters at that moment. It just has a hell of a fine way of doing it. The thing is, is, is that, and I've said this before, consequences and you, the consequences of your actions are a big theme in this show. If Revolver's dad stayed alive, then you could always make the argument, well, Revolver's dad is manipulating him. Well, now you can't, because he's dead. Revolver has no one to blame. He is simply just... Anything he does here is his own evil and his own insanity. And I really liked the contrast that the backstory creates between Yusaku and Revolver and the Professor and Kusanagi and everybody. Like, we knew about soul technologies. I like the fact that the corporate espionage of it all stays in, because obviously soul technologies is probably where we're going next. But what I liked is that it establishes, without having to directly say it, that all of this is because of their guilt. What motivates Revolver and his father is guilt for the sins of their past and fear for what their own creation is going to do to their future. The consequences of their actions. Like, they've done this prediction, and we have it in the real world. We have the fear of singularity. We have the fear of technology taking over, and it's kind of a plausible thing. And I like the idea that um, what would how this would inevitably cause our destruction 
is not necessarily because, oh, one will just want to rule the planets. Like, no, humans got where they are by being aggressive. We got where we are by fighting. We got where we are from being greedy. I like the idea that all these negative things we try to avoid talking about with our sort of our rise to form on this planet are addressed. And it's interesting because it plays back to the human expansion themes in the show, because someone like Yusaku, even though he doesn't seem to really like people or has the ability to really relate to people, he does still believe in protecting them and that humanity should be allowed to go on its own course without someone forcing them on something. So he most likely believes in the positive sides of humanity's growing, while Revolver and his father believe in the negative, and they believe that just from our own, in a way, our own stupidity and our own idiocy, we're going to cause our own destruction, and he's responsible for that. He drove himself basically insane like to the point where that was an ingenious scene where Revolver brought up about soul technologies and he and the professor is like who cares like we gotta stop this we gotta save the freaking world because of what I did and Revolver has to live with that guilt of ignoring it for as long as he did and then when he did something everything still turned out wrong this is a seriously screwed up person and it's such a beautiful contrast with Yusaku's sort of motivation normally the hero hero is the one motivated by guilt and the villain is the one motivated by revenge but by flipping it you create this really fascinating contrast with the characters and how their arcs can develop and grow from here because obviously revolver is not going to die <laughs> he's going to stick around and it'll be fascinating to see how the character grows and how he moves from here and just everything about this worked i thought in the best way possible my only gripe with the backstory and this isn't necessarily a gripe this might be just me I thought in episode 12, when we heard the voice that gave Yusaku the one, two, three thing, I thought the voice sounded older, like it was coming from an adult's voice. I don't know, maybe this is the exact voice, and I don't know, maybe they didn't have Revolver casted yet, maybe they still had a few ideas bouncing around as to how they wanted that to play out, but as far as this goes, I thought this was really good, really tight, really well written, well animated too, I really liked a lot of the shading and a lot of the way color uses, uh, then we, oh, and also, you know, some of those couple lines there, like, oh, I, I gave you your strength, you're fighting me now, that's a little on the nose, but, so be it. So then we move on to the duel, because instead of just shooting Yusaku in the head to get this over with so he can finish his goal, because we're in his house, and let's be real here, this is the kind of guy who keeps a shotgun by his bed. Um, of course, naturally, they gotta do a children's card game, and they gotta do it on top of a giant bubblegum wad, and I liked the duel from what we got of it. Um, I like the way Mirror Force is used, because remember, Mirror Force is dated by today's standards. It's still a board wipe, and the thing is, as far as we can tell, they don't seem to have Raigeki in this world, they don't seem to have Dark Hole or anything super staply, so I could see how, in this context, Mirror Force is a big deal, especially considering Yusaku has a bad deck. But, I like the way the decks were used in this. I liked Revolver went straight for the consistency turn. He went straight for setup. He knew he could bait Yusaku, because Yusaku obviously needs to play around the Mirror Force, so Spell and Trap Destruction isn't obvious. He was able to go plus and setup. And I like the fact that it's back to being a main duel, not a stupid speed duel. Fuck speed duels. I hate them. Um, and then I liked Yusaku's turn too. I like that after he used Link Slayer's effect, finally someone uses Link Slayer. Link Slayer is not an amazing card, but for new kids getting into the game, needing to start off with the Cyber Starter Deck, it's really not a bad card at all. Um, um, frick. Uh, I like that after that, Yusaku then went straight into Xcode Talker to bait out the Mirror Force so he could summon the new thing to attack, and a thousand points is really nothing. <laughs> But he knew he had to bait out the Mirror Force, so he actually did that. And he also set things up, because remember, the new Code Talker summons from the graveyard. Xcode Talker's links go to side to side. Combined with that effect, where you can actually make them indestructible by card effects and give them power, if Yusaku were to play his deck right, and if the writers actually want to do that, he can actually like really set up a very strong board. Again, I don't know if that will happen, but I'd like it to. <laughs> Um, that's all. 
that's a, that's a lot to talk about. Uh, but what can I say? I'm not I'm not afraid to criticize when it's time to criticize. But I love being positive when there's stuff to talk about. So tell me below what you thought of this episode. If you like the symbolism, if you like the color ideas, if you agree with anything I said or disagree, tell me that below. And as for the TCG question of the week, uh, we actually don't have a lot. <laughs> Go, you know, the OCG ban list, I forgot, that came out yesterday. Um, if you want to tell me anything you think about that, fine. Uh, the big thing to me is Ash Blossom went to two, which is worrisome because I, like a lot of people, am getting sick of hand traps. I don't like the fact that my turn, if I go turn one, my turn is not my own anymore. I don't like that since I'm playing Magicians and I have to rely on Electromite, he can be that vulnerable and the whole turn gets shut down. That being said, I think hand traps are essential if Yu-Gi-Oh! is going to stay as fast and as powerful as it is. Now, I don't really follow the OCG meta because I think I could just end up driving myself crazy, but... Um, from what I understand, they try to have a much more diverse metagame. They try to be more about people's own innovations, where we're more competitive, we're more, we play what wins, and then we go for it. I think hand traps are more essential in our format. I don't like Maxi, because I think with the massive need for special summoning, I think that card doesn't really serve its purpose at that point. But as far as the ghost lollies do, and even Gamma, I do think they are important for how our meta works, and I do don't think at this time it's a good idea to get rid of them unless you, you know, sort of, even though I don't want to see my magicians go right away, unless you sort of hurt magicians or maybe limit masterpiece or just sort of do something about what are becoming the common turn one plays. Because as long as things are the way they are, we are going to need hand traps because, well, you know, when an Electromite turn goes off. I can sort of win, and same goes for a lot of other decks. So that's my personal belief. But tell me what you think about that below. And as always, click to like, click to subscribe, and let's hope the positive train keeps going.